study characterized. So just to fix the notation, I will recall the general problem, the one of supervised learning in which there is an unknown relation that we want to study that could be the correct label of some pictures. And uh, we don't want to write down uh, explicit algorithm to do that for the specific G, but we want to learn starting from examples. And so the first ingredient that we need is a training set in which some examples of correct labeling are provided. The second ingredient, of course, is a class of candidate function in order to try to imitate the original G. And this is a, typically a parametric class of function. In order to select the best function in this uh, family, uh, what we do is typically to define a cost function. In this work, we will uh, consider the quadratic one. And we try to minimize it. So we try to minimize the error on the training set. So uh, the strategy of the training is in two steps. The step zero is to initialize randomly the parameters because we don't want to encode the solution already in the initial choice of the parameters, but we want to find the solution variationally by the training. And in particular, the second step of the training, in this case, will be the training of the parameter using gradient descent, so a way to minimize the error at each time step. So the question that we want to try to uh, answer is what will be at the initialization and during the training, the function generated by the quantum neural network that I'm going to define in the next slide. But before, uh, I would like to introduce some problems that may arise in this uh, setting. First of all, and this is very general because it might happen in principle also in the classical case. So the cost function in general is strongly non-convex and therefore this minimization could not be successful. It could get stuck in, with the gradient descent method in a local minimum, which is not the solution that we're looking for. But furthermore, there is a doubt about expressivity because if the number of degrees of freedom is not large enough, the global minimum, provided that we reach it, might not be zero. And so the, the family might not be able to fit, not even the training set. So a strategy could be to try to give more and more degrees of freedom, increase the number of parameters. But then there is another risk in the overparameterized regime, which is the one, the one of overfitting. So yes, we have enough degrees of freedom to provide a perfect fit of the training set, but then on the rest of the input space, uh, there could be complete uh, wrong, completely wrong answer. So uh, in the classical setting, this regime, the overparameterized regime, so the regime in which the number of parameters is way larger than the number of examples, turned out to be somehow successful. And these two papers provided the first uh, mathematical rigorous uh, um, explanation why this is an interesting regime. And so what we want to do is to try to answer this question in the perspective of the overparameterized regime. So uh, let me now define the model that we're going to consider. We start from an initial fixed state. We apply to this state a parameterized uh, circuit, circuit in which layer by layer we encode using parameterized gate the trainable parameters and we make the qubit interact. And furthermore, we are free to encode uh, wherever we want with other uh, parameterized gate the input of the machine learning problem. At the end of the circuit, we have an observable, which is a sum of single qubit terms. The total number of qubits will be called M, this notation, M. Uh, and the output, the function generated by the quantum neural network will be the expectation value at the end of this circuit of the observables computed on the final state, up to a normalization that I will introduce soon. So given an architecture with these uh, properties, what are the main quantities that we should keep in mind during this talk in order to understand uh, 
the hypothesis of the theorem that I'm going to state. First of all, the number of layers of the circuit, and this number of layer might depend on the number of qubit because we are going to consider a limit in which the number of qubit in order to make the circuit overparameterized will go to infinity. And so we do not exclude the cases, which are the most interesting, I think, in which the number of layers is not fixed. So uh, the second important quantities are the past and future light like cones, in particular the maximal cardinalities that uh, they have in a given architecture. So just to, as a reminder, the future light like cone of a parameter is the set of observables depending on that parameter and the past light cone of an observable is the set of all the parameters which are relevant for the final computation of that observable. And finally, as I said, the normalization is the last important quantities of the architecture. And this normalization is chosen so that in the limit of an infinite number of qubits, the covariance of this uh, function, covariance because the parameters are randomly initialized, will be order one. Uh, to have just uh, uh, an intuition on about the need of this uh, constant normalization, constant, constant if m is fixed, <laughs> it's uh, in the case when we sum IID random variables. In that case, you perfectly know that the normalization that we need is one over square root of m in order to have a non-trivial limit. So let's start answering that question at the step zero, so when we initialize the parameters. Having a sum of local observables, we will have a function given by the sum of m different terms. And uh, uh, a naive approach could be, OK, maybe this is uh, similar to the case of the central limit theorem, where we have uh, IID random variables, we consider the sum, and the limit is uh, a Gaussian random variable. But of course, we have uh, two problems to take into account. First of all, here we have function, we don't have only random variables, so um, we need to define a sort of Gaussian distribution generalized to function, but this is just a technical aspect. The crucial aspect that we have in these quantum circuits is that these terms, which are random variables because they depend on the random parameters, are not necessarily independent. And this can be easily seen in this example, in which, uh, considering two observables, they might have in the circuit some uh, common parameters, and therefore they cannot be independent. And so we will need to take into account all these dependencies. So for the first point, the definition of uh, a generalization of the Gaussian distribution to function, well, we have to introduce the notion of Gaussian process that maybe you already know. Whenever we have a family of random variables, which might be infinite, the index here may belong to an infinite set. We say that this family is a Gaussian process whenever we have the following property. If we take a finite subset of this family of random variables, the joint distribution of this subset is a joint Gaussian distribution. Concerning the dependencies, uh, the technique that we use to study this, uh, this case is uh, uh, the one provided in this reference, and this is the technique of dependency graph. So we applied this, I would say, generalized version of the central limit theorem to the case of quantum circuits. So what we need to do to study the probability distribution of the sum of these terms, which are not independent, is to uh, study and consider the dependency graph, all the dependencies. This is uh, just an example for this circuit of uh, the case that we are studying in order to have some uh, uh, hypothesis to bound the non-Gaussianity of the final distribution. And in particular, uh, our first uh, main result of uh, this work is that whenever 
the light cones of a given architecture are narrow enough asymptotically compared to the normalization, then the initial output distribution of the quantum neural network will be a Gaussian process. So what about now the training? What can we say about these doubts and these potential problems? First of all, a necessary step is to try to understand uh, what this evolution equation for the parameters mean, means uh, in terms of the model itself. So we can just use a simple uh, chain rule in the derivative in order to translate this equation into a differential equation for the function. And as you can see, the protagonist of this evolution is this quantity. Uh, bivariate function, which is called empirical neural tangent kernel. And uh, it makes, as you can see, the solution, the analytical solution of this equation very hard because there is a time dependence here. So if this was constant, it would be easy to solve the equation, but it is not the case. So what can we do in order to give an answer to the question? Well, the first ingredient is to prove that in the overparameterized regime, the training asymptotically belongs to a really small portion around the initial parameter. So given any initial parameter, at least high probability, the evolution will be confined into a really small region. And therefore, it makes sense, at least heuristically, to consider the first order tailored expansion of the model and say, OK, this might be a good approximation of the original model because the displacement in the parameter space is very small. Why is it interesting to study this model, which is not the original one? Well, because the differential equation for the evolution of this model becomes easy to solve. Indeed, here we don't have any more the time dependence, and therefore we can write down the explicit solution for this uh, uh, differential equation. So the final ingredient is to prove that our intuition of having a good approximation uh, with this uh, first order Taylor expansion is a good intuition because uh, asymptotically we can rigorously prove that the two trajectory in the parameter space and the two function generator converges and therefore the solution provided for the linearized model is asymptotically the solution for the original model. And this solution has two properties. First of all, it is uh, um, it's maybe not, it, it's not very easy to see it in this form, but it's not difficult to prove that it, uh, it's a solution asymptotically in T fitting the training set. So it will provide a good fit of a perfect fit of the training set. And second, it's a linear combination of the function at initialization, so it's a linear combination of Gaussian process, and therefore it's a Gaussian process itself. So the theorem that we proved is that uh, under the hypothesis of narrow light cones, and assuming of course that we are not choosing a pathological circuit for which <coughs> this uh, quantity in the differential equation, the neural tangent curve, do not exist or is, is not invertible, but this is a bit pathological, I would say. Then we have the perfect fit of uh, the training set. So the cost is exponentially decreasing in time. And uh, we know the probability distribution of the function generated, which is regular. So it will not something strongly dependent on the number of parameter on the initialization point. On the contrary, it will be uh, independent asymptotically on the initialization and independent and more and more regular. It will be a, indeed a Gaussian process as the overparameterized regime is achieved. So concerning these three doubts, we have uh, some answers. The initial Gaussian process will be a new Gaussian process perfectly fit in the training set. And this is at least an answer about the 
regularity. Of course, we are not talking about the generalization performance. We are not discussing uh, how well it could uh, fit the rest of the original function. But at least it will not be uh, strongly irregular. In the quantum case, differently from the um, classical case, we have a further point, which is the noise, statistical noise. Indeed, the model function is defined as an expectation value of a quantum observable. And therefore, the model itself is not known unless we perform an infinite number of measurements to provide a perfect estimator of this expectation value. And therefore, the differential equation that we studied in practice is not this. It's a discrete time evolution with an estimator of the gradient of the post function. But we proved that in order to uh, retrieve all the previous results about trainability and regularity, this bound on the variance is sufficient. But it looks really complicated, but what does it mean? Well, it just means that in order to have an epsilon small error at the end of the training or at the, at the time t star, uh, the number of measurement will be bounded by this really rough estimate, which is polynomial. These quantities are just polynomial in the number of qubits. So a polynomial number of total measurements in order to train the quantum neural network is sufficient taking into account this statistical noise. So uh, I will just spend one last minute talking about the problem of barren plateaus that you probably already know when the cost function is very flat, then we do not expect these uh, uh, models to be trainable. But the first thing that we have uh, to notice is that this um, phenomenon will be associated with a exp um, exponentially decreasing normalization constant using the results of this paper in the number of layers, exponentially decreasing in the number of layers and therefore, whenever there are variant plateaus, so um, this is also exponential in the number of qubits, we can see it's easy to prove that our hypothesis uh, will uh, fail. And therefore, we are not proving that when there are variant plateaus, the quantum neural network are trainable. On the contrary, uh, when we do not have uh, variant plateaus, there is some hope to have trainability. And more precisely, there are some examples of architecture which are trainable in the regime which is free of bar from barren plateaus. If we consider a number of layer which is logarithmic in the number of qubits and a geometry for the circuit, which is not just the one dimensional, but we consider, for instance, the two dimensional square lessons of qubit with nearest neighbor interaction, or not necessarily nearest neighbor, but just this is to simplify. Uh, when epsilon is small enough and the hypothesis of our theorem are satisfied, and furthermore, this non-trivial geometry will make uh, the circuit at least uh, not uh, classically computable in a simple way. So we don't know so far some uh, simple way, and in general, we don't know any way to compute classically in this setting uh, what happens in the local Hilbert spaces defining each observable. So this might be, as an open question, an interesting um, setting to study to see if something can be said about the simulability or the potential quantum advantages. So in order to conclude, I just want to say that um, in this work, we have studied the overparameterized regime in which uh, quantum neural network turned out to be uh, a Gaussian process at initialization, turned out to be trainable and uh, producing a regular function uh, during the training. All these results are stable under statistical noise up to a 
polynomial number of measurements. And so the step in the future might be, first of all, to give quantitative bound to find the discrepancy of the result. So the discrepancy between the probability distribution of a finite site circuit and the corresponding Gaussian process. And we are working on these bounds in order to understand better the speed of convergence. A uh, more subtle question would be understand the role of the finite size uh, effect if they have some uh, properties, if they can help uh, training what is their role in the generalization power of the circuit. It will be very interesting finally to understand if there is a strategy, as I said before, maybe to classically simulate in this region where it is not known for the moment, or if on the contrary, uh, some, uh, some particular architecture, some settings, some problems are suitable uh, to look for a super polynomial quantum advantage in terms of quantum machine learning in this setting. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Filippo. And now we have some time for questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was a great talk, so thank you. Um, I'm sorry if you said this, um, but I didn't quite catch it. Um, did you say that the regime where barren plateaus occur is outside of the scope of um, your assumptions? So, uh, so I was a bit confused how barren plateaus interact with uh, yeah okay process. so we, we already know that uh, when we have barren plateaus since we have very flat landscape um, when we have barren plateaus the the quantum neural network is not trainable so it would be a bit contradictory to say if there are barren plateaus then our result is like this no our our hypothesis the hypothesis that I said that I showed in uh, the theorems like uh, this hypothesis will fail because this normalization constant will be exponentially small. And so this limit will not be zero, it will be infinite. So when we have barren plateaus, we cannot hope to have all these, uh, at least with our techniques, we will not have this result. In general, we will not have trainability. But there are, what I wanted to say in this slide is that there are some interesting regimes which are free which are free from barren plateau. So in the regime in which L is logarithmic and epsilon is small enough, this normalization constant will not be exponentially suppressed. And in these regimes, our hypotheses are satisfied. So it's in that regime that uh, we need to deepen uh, the consequences of our result. All right, thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more question. <clears throat> In that case, I'll ask. So you pointed out that um, you observed this kind of lazy training yeah. where the train parameter is actually very close to the initial parameter setting. At the same time, you're also saying that training achieves a perfect fit. So somehow that means that if I randomly initialize close to that initialization, there's always a good parameter setting? Yeah, because the... Um the solution to have perfect fit is not unique. Right. So um, I don't have a picture here, but uh, you should imagine this uh, landscape to be more and more full of uh, uh, local minima, which are global minima at the same time. And so wherever you initialize the um, parameters, you will be able to reach the global minimum, which is not unique. And all the quantities that appears in the solution will concentrate around their expectation value. So the solution will be globally unique also using different parameters. All right, very nice, thank you. Then uh, let's thank Filippo again and we'll...